Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I usually do on Sundays, but I'm doing a midweek uh, version of it. We are down near St. Augustine Beach. This is the uh, Moses Creek Conservation Area that I'm shooting this video, uh, shooting this video in. Uh, it's really wild. We, Steph and I, go on adventures, and normally we do a lot of hiking, do a lot of botanizing in the woods uh, but it's so wet everywhere uh, we're we're looking for paved paths right now it's gone from two months ago or yeah about two month and a half ago or so we were gotten back from that big trip out west and everything was so dry as we were coming across from east texas across the you know toward north carolina all the reservoirs were low all the rivers were low everything was low and now no matter where you go uh, you can't hike anywhere. Everything's just gone. It's, it's the opposite. Flooded. Flooded now uh, from, from so dry. So just a real flip. Uh, since um, I put up the Sunday q and I put up a cold weather protection video. We were doing covering some things. Obviously, now you know we're in, we've come down to Florida uh, temporarily. Uh, and so I had to cover some things before I left. So that video went up Monday. It looked like last, looked like on Tuesday night, that we saw about 16 at the house in Raleigh and Saturday night looks like it's like 18 or 19. So I'm guessing others, you know, as you're watching out there, I have other cold weather protection videos on the channel. And so a lot of the questions I'm getting right now is about protecting plants. You can, if you watch that video that I put up Monday, I linked two other videos um, that for cold weather and how, cause it, you know, when I put up one, it might be just what I'm doing that day in our garden. But when I've put up previous ones, I've really thought through more about all the different scenarios that somebody might need to protect plants or how to cover plants. Anyway, let's jump into uh, to some questions. So this is kind of a continuation of the questions from two weeks ago. Uh, there were so many good questions uh, from that video. Uh, number one, uh, let's see. Somebody was asking about best vines to put on the house. I really don't, you know, you pick whatever vine suits you, but I would encourage you not to put one that has hold fast, meaning that the vine actually roots into the structure. So the vines that can do that, um, you know, climbing hydrangea is definitely one that could do that. Obviously, English ivy is one that would do that. Uh, let me think. Uh, my Confederate, Confederate jasmine will develop some uh, hold fast uh, on things. And that just means they're going to root onto the structure and potentially either stain it, discolor it, require you to paint it. Uh, they're harder to take down uh, when you need to take them down. So I would put some sort of vine that's just vining and requires you to put it, you know, to actually put it on the house. So clematis is a great example of that. Cl clematis clematis. I need to say it both ways, right? Um, and, uh, you know, honeysuckles typically, uh, Carolina jessamine would be one. I mean, there's, there's, keep in mind, vines are maintenance. And so I've talked about that a couple weeks ago. We don't have a whole lot of vines at the house. I do love vines, but I kind of like for other people to maintain vines more than me. At some point, you got to cut them down. You'll have to paint. You have to do whatever maintenance you, gotta, you have to do. Sometimes they just need to be reset in some way. So as long as it's not holding fast to the house, that'll be easy pro an easier project. Okay, so somebody, um, and, and again, I, you know, I encourage, you know, when I'm doing these question and answer videos, if somebody has a vine uh, that comes to mind that's been really an easy one to have on your house or your porch rail or something like that, you know, throw it out uh, down below. Uh, and it can be helpful to the person who's as asking the question. Uh, let's see. So again, a lot of cold weather related questions, you know, it seems, uh, you know, a little late for me to be answering some of, some of these, but you know, leafy evergreen things, if you have them out in areas, you know, where it's going to be, has been below zero, those things probably need to be, a lot of them need to be wrapped up outside of like rhododendrons and pieris and a few things that are really zone five hardy. There's a lot of, I got a lot of questions about leafy evergreen things in very, very cold areas. Uh, and, you know, as you, as you travel, you know, I'm in Florida right now, and of course I have the palms behind me. But what you'll notice when you come to Florida, you know, as I, as I look around me now, uh, I can see wax myrtles, uh, I can see inkberry hollies, I see evergreen vines, 
you know, like honeysuckles. Uh, I see evergreen trees. You know, we have the, you know, including the pines and of course the live oak. Uh, I think they're I think you can see this live oak that's behind me here. Uh, there's water oaks. Uh, in fact, that is a water oak. Um, there are a lot, a lot of the things you'll see down here are evergreen. Uh, and as you move up the East Coast, even by the time you get to Raleigh, where I'm at, you know, in the kind of the, the central part of the East Coast of the United States, if you just look into the woods this time of year, there's not a lot of evergreen things. By that point, we do we still have some Southern Magnolias. We still have some uh, American Hollies. So we'll see some evergreen things in the wooded areas, but not as many. And then by the time you get further north than that. So it's just not natural for a lot of these leafy evergreens to be in some of these colder colder areas so when you're going to plunge the point of all that is when you're going to plunge down to zero and you have a bunch of leafy evergreens and you're in one of these areas that you can look around and go well there's not really any evergreen plants here <laughs> in the winter time uh, you probably need to think about protecting them in these extremes you know you know won't have to do it every winter but when we have extremes uh, of temperature they probably do need protection okay if we can flip the page here so somebody has a quart, they planted a bilia this past season and they were in quart pots uh, when they planted them and they didn't bloom this first season. Uh, is that unusual? I like to pick a question like this occasionally just to point out that your plants are not gonna perform the way they're gonna perform uh, you know, the first year in the ground. It's just, it's just not, it, there's the occasion and it happens to me uh, you know occasionally i'll plant something and i'll look back at it and go holy moly that thing doubled in size the first year but what's more common is for plants to just kind of settle in put on a small amount of growth keep in mind abelia bloom on new growth so they bloom in the summertime typically and it's usually in my area they bloom in the summertime you'll notice as you go further and further south abelia tend to be spring and fall flowering uh, and, and kind of shut down a bit during the summertime. But in my area, they bloom from June right through fall, something like that, but they bloom on new growth. So if you put it, if you planted something as a quart pot that didn't put on a lot of new growth during the season, that's where your flowers would have been. Plus you're planting something as a quart pot, which I love planting small containers. Um, I really do because I can save money. I, can, I, I enjoy watching things grow and develop. But that also means you also have to require patience, right? If we're planting quart pots and we're waiting for something to grow out. So again, things planted in the first year, uh, you know, minor things going on with them, uh, I'm just not going to worry about until something's been, if something's two, three, four years in the ground and it still hasn't flowered like it was supposed to, that's something I'm probably gonna dig up and replant, assume I have it in too much shade or sun or wet or dry or something and get it moved to some other place. Okay, so somebody's got Shindo viburnum with multiple leaders. Are they okay or should they prune it down to one? I've, I haven't seen a large Shindo viburnum that didn't have multiple uh, leaders uh, coming, coming from the bottom. I'm guessing you can grow one as a single trunk. I haven't seen any nurserymen do it. Uh, so I think any pruning they're doing on them in the nursery is encouraging suckering and it doesn't seem to have any negative impact on them whatsoever. If you're size controlling them in the future, they may end up looking weird though. If you have eight trunks and you're constantly trying to keep them six feet, they're gonna be weird. So I encourage you to put, and I, we did the neighborhood walk around tour and I so, showed some shindos and the guy's been pruning them about six or seven feet tall since they've been in the ground. I don't know if he's planning on holding them there, but I think shindo viburnum, fantastic screening plant, really fast growing once they get going. Uh, Again, it's one I recommend quite a bit, but I'd put it in a place where you can expect it to get 20 feet tall and just let it. Uh, and, I, and I think they look really, really good uh, when that's the case. Somebody asked about um, landscaping for restaurants uh, that they see. Is, that, is the landscaping mandated uh, by the town or something like that because they have some restaurants that are beautifully landscaped uh, near them? So there will definitely be some sort of local uh, requirement for construction, for new construction, as to what they have to include in order to get a certificate of occupancy for any any building, honestly, in, in, in any house, typically, uh, in any town's going to have some minimum set of requirements. So, I've, I've joked before 
that I, I used to work for a landscaper and we did seven shrubs in a cloud of dust. So we would, we, we had a man, one of the towns we worked in had seven, you had to plant seven shrubs. It had to have one tree, but if there was a tree on the property already, that was adequate. So that checked that off. And then we would sod the front, seed the back and we were out. But I, again, seven shrubs in a cloud of dust. That's what I called that type of landscaping. So you can have as minimal as that up to towns that require for every so many parking places that are in that commercial property you have to have a tree that's pretty common uh, most of those laws were were helped by the horticulture industry uh, well, you know there's there's definitely some lobbying going on there uh, for, for, for sure because a lot of those laws are kind of the backbone of of sales in the horticulture business for sure uh, so there'll, there'll be per amount of parking places and now we're seeing more and more a requirement to capture water runoff on the parking lots so we'll see uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see um, uh, strategies to keep you know inst instead of mounding up things between the parking places we'll see sunken areas and so there'll be plants planted for for tr basically trying to keep all that oil and all those materials from running off the parking lot and getting them into the ground back into the um, getting them back in through the system like they're supposed to, where the water's supposed to go into the ground and then out into the rivers and streams that way. Rather than currently, all of our grading has, the water runs off the roof, runs down the driveway, runs onto the road, runs into a gutter, and runs directly into streams and rivers uh, and you know pollutes as it goes. We're trying to get the water into the ground. So more and more of that construction would be uh, requiring them to filter the water leaving the parking lot so there are there can't just depends on the municipality how much level of of requirements there are then of course if that restaurant's buying a piece of property on a uh or leasing a piece of property in a shopping center that individual shopping center is going to have requirements so some shopping centers are going to have very bare bones requirements as as we know and then some are going to be very high level that that shopping center itself is going to require that restaurant or out parcel to duplicate whatever it is they have on the rest of their properties so that everything kind of looks uniform uh, and they're trying to have a different look. So again, these there's lots of requirements and it just depends on where you are, what you bought, where you, where you are. And then of course the individual owner of that restaurant or whatever kind of out parcel could also be someone who really wants to make a statement as well. And so the architect, landscape architect would be involved in that. So again, there's a lot of layers there and it could be somebody trying to do the minimum to get in the building all the way up to, I want something that really is part of, you know, why people want to come here. If you go, there's a, and there's a few breweries now that have built, you know, um, uh, amazing landscapes to lure people in, you know, the, the basically botanic gardens uh, to lure people into their breweries and things. Um, Red Oak over in uh, uh, near Greensboro is an example of that, where that, you know, the landscaping around there is part of the appeal. So that's probably what you're seeing as these restaurants. So I've said a lot of words there, but there are a lot of mandated things and it's different for everywhere you go. Um, okay. So somebody has a wet area and they saw that white cloud mully grass as part of the neighborhood walk around tour, wanted to use it. The wet area has itea and clethora, um, larch. Um, they wanted to add some white cloud mully grass to it. I don't think you'd probably want to put it in an oh, area that stays wet. Your other plants there, the itea and clethora, when we find them, and in fact, I would, this would be a place where I would see them in their native areas, they'll be standing in water but that mully grass would want to dry out. You are seeing it in a space at the Raleigh Rose Garden where it was planted in a low spot in a water collection area, but that soil base that they used in that sunken area drains really, really well. So those grasses are probably staying underwater at the max 12 hours, and then they're pretty dry uh, within a short period of time after that. So I don't, I don't think you're gonna be a, Maybe you can. Maybe you could mound them up within your wet area a little bit. Uh, anytime you're experimenting with something and you're questioning something like that, that's the don't go buy 40 white cloud mully grass to experiment with. Go buy one or two. Experiment with it for a season. See how it does and then add more after. And that way you have a, you're not out a giant amount of money uh, in testing something like that. Okay, so somebody... 
is in zone seven. They have a small lot. They want to remove a, a huge uh, magnolia that's in a small front yard. And they just asked me if it was a good idea. That is completely up to you. If that magnolia is not making you happy in some way, there's plenty of Southern magnolias. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at one uh, just to my right, right here. There's uh, Southern magnolias are, uh, uh, there's, there's lots of them out in, in, in our wooded spaces. And even in our neighborhood where a lot has never been developed or something, you know, there's Southern magnolias just growing, you know, wild. Uh, in, in my neighborhood. So it's not like it's, it's not like it's threatened uh, in some way. And they're very difficult to landscape with. If I have, so I had a Southern Magnolia at the old house because my lot was almost an acre. At this house, I don't have one because it's 0.19 acres and it would be very difficult to landscape with it. It's, the roots are tough. They're dry underneath. The big giant leaves drop on everything. It's super shady and it's never not shady you know because it's you know it keeps its leaves in the winter so it's even shady during the you know the even january it's shading the ground difficult to landscape with beautiful you know amongst my favorite plants on the garden walk around tour it was right at the top of the list of something i'd want to show off in the neighborhood beautiful little gym magnolias but yeah so for it's for, when you ask me is it a good idea uh my opinion matters not at all it's whether or not that plant's making you happy, it's taking up too much of your lot, you're not enjoying it in some way, I would absolutely you know, take it down if I was you and I'd have the mulch it right in place so it can feed the plants you know, that you're gonna put in its place. And they were asking you know, what's a good replacement and weeping cherries on their list. And so yeah, if weeping cherry would make you happier, you know, go for it. Uh, there are probably, it's one area that uh, the United States the, we have lots of great native trees in the U.S. And so there's lots of great ornamental trees that you could use if you were thinking about taking out one native uh, and replacing it. Maybe that's an opportunity that you could plant an amelanchier or uh, uh, what else would I come up with for a native plant? It's, it's, it's got to be full sun. Uh, uh, American fringe tree would be another one. So there's, there's stuff standing right here. Uh, there are, we have lots of great native understory trees that you could plant out there if you wanted to replace a native with a native also. Okay, somebody asked about lower petal and pruning. They want a more natural shape instead of meatballs. Uh, the landscaper, uh, some landscaper had turned them into balls. And I, I, there's a second neighborhood tour coming uh, in the next few days and I actually show uh, Laura Petalum that have been cut down to balls because again the original Laura Petalum got 25 feet tall and now we have ones that only get three or four feet tall but a lot of them 25 foot ones are still out in the world in places that are not screening plants but you know on foundations or next to driveways or in this case in this video right next to the sidewalk and so they're constantly cutting them back so they're they're losing flowers they rarely have a lot of the growth the color and the gr new growth because uh, they're just constantly pruning them. Uh, they wanted to have a more natural shape. They want to know if they could reset them, like cut them down to the ground. You can absolutely reset them. I will tell you though, sometimes on old established, fast growing evergreens like this, when you cut them down to the ground, that thing will try to grow back eight feet in a year because it's got this big giant root system and it can be a little thin and wispy. So as it comes back out of the ground, for about every two feet of growth you get on it, I might cut it back just a little bit uh, this first season. So every two, if you get to, when you get two feet of growth, which is going to happen very fast, uh, I would take it about a foot off of that, uh, and then do that a couple times uh, until you uh, uh, until it gets some height on it, and then let it go. That way, it has a good amount of branching before you let it go. Otherwise, I think you're going to get six or eight pieces racing up out of the ground, and it's going to be this thin, wispy. Thing. Next up, somebody wants to get rid of Bermuda grass in Georgia, how to get rid of it, when, with what, uh, and the, uh, when can they recede with fescue. I think maybe, I don't know where you are in Georgia, but if you're basically from Atlanta south, uh, you're probably going to struggle with fescue and that the reason that people are, have Bermuda 
uh, near you is it's because it's done, the southern grasses like Bermuda centipede. I always missed one somehow. I always say one twice. Bermuda, Bermuda centipede, zoysia, and St. Augustine. And I'm in St. Augustine or south of St. Augustine right now. Crescent Beach is where I'm actually at. Um, you, you, the reason that those, I mean, they're southern grasses, but they go dormant uh, in the winter time, and then they're Bermuda being the worst, but they're all creeping to, you know, creeping grasses. They're self-repairing grasses, which is kind of nice, where definitely fescue is not. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have a lot of inputs with your fescue. And typically, if you want to do a whole new fescue lawn, that would be a fall-related project. Typically, uh, seeding, uh, if you were going to sod it, of course, you could do that in the spring. Your issue with the Bermuda, getting rid of the Bermuda grass is that it's dormant right now. And it's near, unless you're using like a sod cutter to cut it out, and that probably wouldn't do it either. Uh, you probably need to uh, wait for it to wake up. And when it wakes up, uh, the best way to kill it is probably spraying it with Roundup. You know, I hate, to, you know, <laughs> nobody wants to hear that, but you know, how else are you going to get, you know, it needs to be actively growing and kill it and kill it with Roundup. That's the best way to do it. You can try all the covering, get a sod cutter. You know, you could go get a sod cutter and cut it as sod and then flip it upside down. That would kill some small portion of it. Um, you know, and then you use this. I want you to get to the starting line as quick as possible. I say this in consultations sometimes. If it's gonna take you a year to get to the starting line because you're not, you're trying not to spray something, I would spray something, get that part behind you and then move on and start to impre improve this you know, uh, improve the soil if you're going to be putting in beds and that kind of thing, and then get, you know, your fescue put in place. But I think you're going to struggle with fescue. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm, give, I'm telling everybody when and how to kill the Bermuda, but I'm also telling this person at the same time that I think that this conversion to fescue, monoculture turfs are all tough, but we are growing warm season grasses in the south because number one, they're self-repairing, and number two, you know, the summer, you know, they're, they'll tolerate our hot, hot, hot summers. So somebody said they saw Mahonia labeled as Berberus. And so this is uh, interesting because of another video you guys are going to see this next week is the flowering plant of the month video is actually Mahonia. So Mahonia and uh, barberries are very, very closely related. Uh, and in fact, Mahonia has been moved over to the genus Berberus, which is barberry. Uh, but I guess uh, some of the genetic work that's been done, there are definitely differences between them. So I guess we're in the middle of one of those things where it may move back to Mahonia here at some point. But cur yes, currently Mahonia is in the uh, genus Berberus. A uh, spoiler alert, in my video, I call them Mahonias. And, and I will probably, con <laughs> there's a lot of us who probably will never, you know, it's like the dogwoods being divided out into different groups. It's like, uh, there's a lot of people that are just like, no, that's one that I will just call dogwood uh, going forward. So, but that video is coming up uh, this week. Uh, and, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities between them. You, when they flower, you can definitely see the similarities between them. They're also both typically very good at producing seed, uh, which is, you know, some Mahonia, you know, is pretty invasive and lots of barberries are, are invasive. So they have that similarity as well. Uh, a lot of the barberries are either thorny or the, you know, the, when you see a lot of different species of barberries, it starts to become more obvious how related to Mahonia they are. Okay, uh, so I had mentioned last week that the uh, yellow butterfly bushes uh, tend to be uh, inferior, and then someone said down at the bottom they had one that looks great, and that's that, that's great. But I I grew uh, one called uh, it was Sun Gold, and the other one was called Honeycomb. Uh, for years and tried to grow those things and I would get consistent mite problems where you know nature was just kind of kind of trying to destroy them it was uh, it was obvious that only my yellow budlio would have mites and the others would not uh, you know so it just became obvious real quick and then they just they didn't have a lot of vigor in the ground uh, either so if you have one that looks great I don't know what variety it is you might want to uh, throw that out uh, down below because I have never found one that I thought was uh, as vigorous as the other butterfly bushes. Uh, so somebody asked about winter sowing in milk containers. Uh, are people successful with it? They see more and more about it. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of people that do this winter sowing uh, of seed outside uh, in, in containers. 
I, I've always done mine on the light rack in the house. I've got a video on how I built my light rack. I've got lots of videos on how I start seed. I do it all indoors. Uh, I think this is comes from my time as a nurseryman. You know, I like to have control over things. I, I don't want a situation where I'm doing something and I'm questioning any part of it in my mind. <laughs> Just because, again, for, back from my nursery days, you can't, you can't stick a bunch of cuttings and go, well, I hope that works out. Um, you know, you got to, you got employees to pay and, you know, bills to pay and, you know, you have to have a certain amount of success. So I, I tend to set up things that I can duplicate season to season. I'll experiment, but I want to make sure that I'll be able to duplicate it over and over. So that's the only reason that you don't ever see me uh, doing that. But there's tons of videos on YouTube about it. Tons of uh, people that are successful with you know, sowing seed in the winter time in plastic jugs and things outside. And then they stay, they sit like that until it's time to put them, put them in the ground. I will tell you that things like tomatoes, uh, they will get nutrient deficiencies in cold weather. So some of the things you may see some purpling, especially uh, tomato plants will turn kind of a purple color. That's a phosphorus deficiency that happens in cold weather. Uh, so you know, keep that in mind. There may be some initial uh, nutrient deficiencies based on the plant being overly cold. It has a hard time taking up certain nutrients. It'll certainly overcome that when you put it in the ground, but it's another thing uh, that I know and kind of relates to another uh, question that's coming up. Uh, so let's see, somebody has their, they mulched last year. Their mulch is mostly broken down or partially broken down. They want to use, they want to put down some soil cube compost or soil cube, soil cube humus uh, and will it benefit the plant? So there, I would make sure that mulch is really broken down before you put the compost or humus on top of that. So they want to put the soil cube down and then put mulch again. It'll be great uh, combo to do for sure, but let's make sure that that mulch that you did last year is pretty much completely broken down because we don't want to start burying that wood material deeper and deeper and deeper down into the ground because we can set up anaerobic conditions. When, when, wood, material, when wood fiber can't get the oxygen that it needs uh, to break down, uh, it can go, it can, instead of having, instead of creating beneficial bacteria, beneficial fungi, uh, it can do the opposite and we end up with anaerobic conditions. And in the, in the Q&A on Sunday, I'm going to go into that uh, in a little bit, a little bit more detail because there's a question from this past, Q, past week's Q&A. Uh, but just, just keep that in mind. Try not to bury wood material too deep. Let it break down enough where it's, not much of that wood left at all. And then absolutely, I've got a link down below the video for a soil cube compost if you're interested. I think it's North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Maybe it's expanded to some other places uh, at this point. Somebody has a, uh, an area without any direct sun, a little L-shape part around their house. There is a crepe myrtle in the middle of it, wanted to know what they can plant. That's obviously gonna be a dry shade space in all likelihood, crepe myrtles can be pretty, uh, uh, pretty greedy uh, during the summertime for sure. And I've also talked about the fact that they can discolor some things underneath them during the summertime. But those, I've got several videos on the channel for dry shade uh, options. So things like cast iron plants. In fact, there's a walk around video that we did last week from the uh, Ralston that had a few things. Mahonia definitely comes to mind for that. Uh, if you, over at the Ralston, there's a little space called the Asian Valley and it's all dry shade area. And there's lots of Akuba, cast iron plants, uh, rhodia, japonica, and I've said, I just said mahonia, akuba, probably missing some other things. But anyway, there are some dry shade plant videos on the channel. So if you search on YouTube, Jim Putnam, dry shade or shade plants, that kind of, you, you'll, you'll find them. But I've been concentrating more and more on that. There's definitely two types of shade conditions. And there's dry shade and, and wet shade, uh, and they require pretty much different plants uh, to be successful. Somebody had a concrete slab removed, uh, and it's a slushy, wet space at this point. Um, they want to plant something to prevent runoff. Uh, and it's, it's down in the Atlanta area, which probably probably doesn't matter. But if you take out, you know, a concrete sidewalk or something in that de little depressed place, I have had swampy clay messes, you know, uh, in those kind of places where we've taken out sidewalks and then, you know, maybe put in some other type of sidewalk. Uh, but it is a 
tends to be a messy, wet space. It really needs to be regraded a little bit. That low area, need to pull soil into that low area and make sure your grading is done well before you start planting into it. If you plant into that really wet clay uh, based soil in a sunken area, uh, there are not a lot of plants that like those types of conditions. So I, I, would, I would concentrate on how you can grade it properly to make sure that water is getting out of that space and then you can get to improving that soil a bit and then plant something. Uh, but I think you're going to struggle to find something that just wants to be dumped into a uh, wet clay soil that's kind of sunken in. Somebody asked the difference between Carex and variegated liriope. Um, so, you know, I've shown more and more Carexes. It's kind of interesting. Uh, know a couple people that do nothing but grow grasses. You know, that's their entire nursery. And I was uh, listening to one talk about, you know, 30 years ago, they had absolutely no Carex in their line whatsoever. They had all ornamental grasses and then, of course, some liriope. Grasses are in a plant family called the Poaceae. Um, we all love, let's see, uh, wheat, rice, and corn. They're all in the Poaceae. And then, of course, that Bermuda grass we were talking about, fescue, those are actual grasses in the Poaceae. Liriope is actually in the, um, is an asparagus. It's in the asparagus family. So that, um, and then Carex is in its own, it's, it's in a family called Cyperaceae. And so, uh, Carex, that one of the main differences is there's 2,000 species of Carex. There are Carex. We're in this wooded area right here in Florida. Florida will have lots of its own species of Carex, including if we go down to the Everglades, all that grass that you see out in the Everglades is a Carex. So it's the sedge family. Uh, the Carexes, um, most of the ornamental Carexes that we use prefer some shade. Liriope will take some shade, but it would probably prefer a little more sun. Um, than shade. There's just a ton of different Carexes. It's kind of funny, again, going back to that nursery, they had no Carexes 30 years ago, and now they're trying to figure out how to start cutting some of the Carexes that they're growing. They're growing so many. So it's like, it's like a discovery we made that we had these great ornamental grass-like plants that are evergreen in our woodlands all over America and all over the world. It's like, a, you know, and then there's a lot of plant breeders out there working on them. So things like Ever, the Ever series that Southern Living Plant Collection has with that uh, Ever Rillo, which is the gold one that you see in a lot of my videos, and then Ever Gold and Ever Rillo, uh, uh, I won't remember the other ones right this minute, but Carex is like a, <laughs> it's like discovering something that was always there. Uh, lots and great native uh, Carexes. And where Liriope, I think there's only like six, maybe eight species of Liriope. Liriope muscari is the one that most people want to use. It's the clumping Liriope that you get variegated or green. And then there's interesting ones. I always thought I didn't like Liriope. And the more uh, botanic gardens I go to and the more uh, really high level gardeners I'm around, you know, you get these really cool giant ones and there's a lot of other interesting Liriope muscari uh, out there. Liriope spicata is the spreading Liriope and you definitely want to avoid it if you can because it can take over, take over your garden. But visually there's not a lot of difference between them. Liriope muscari, the clumping Liriope, and then these clumping Carexes, you know, they're all similar. The Carexes tend to be uh, a little more uh, tolerant of shade uh, overall, but both are worthy ornamental plants. I just think from the side of Carex, where we just, a lot of people weren't growing them, uh, now it's just more and more and more and, and more and more will be bred and more interesting varieties to come. Okay, uh, so somebody asked about, you know, we use mulch to suppress weeds and all the other good things that it does, regulating soil temperature and uh, moisture and all those kinds of things that mulch does, um, how do you then direct seed your flower beds? You, you can't really uh, consistently use hardwood mulch and then throw out seed uh, over the top of them and have it perform well. I think you're, the, the areas that you want to do your cottage garden direct seeding thing, I think you want to pull the mulch back and then use something like that soil cube compost or pine bark soil conditioner or some combo of those two things. Uh, as your top dress uh, and seed into that looser 
uh, that looser material uh, to get a more consistent outcome. It doesn't mean that you can't direct seed into hardwood mulch with some success, but I think you'd have a lot more success. I did a video with Bree Arthur at her house maybe three years ago on direct seeding. If, again, if you search Jim Putnam um, with Bree or with, or, uh, with you know, direct seeding, uh, that video I think was pretty informative. Of, I had her on the channel uh, talking about it, but again, she work in those beds a little bit. It's not a it's not a mulched it's not a hardwood mulched bed. Uh, they're definitely a looser soil, and she's using compost again. I, I mentioned soil cube twice in this video, but it doesn't matter. You know whatever compost you want to use, but some sort of looser material, and then those seeds need to be typically covered just a hair. You know raked in just a hair, uh, just gently. Uh, you can see that in that video. Somebody asked about using wheat straw in, as mulch to improve the soil. Yeah, absolutely. Wheat straw will break down and improve soil maybe break down um you, you don't want it too thick i mean it can it's another one of those materials that at a certain depth it starts to rot underneath instead of uh, in, instead of breaking down uh, make sure you're using wheat straw and not hay uh, make sure there's no a lot, a lot of seed in it uh, because you know if you used straw that had still had the seed in it you end up with you know, wheat coming up everywhere or whatever it is coming up everywhere. So, um, okay, so somebody got some things from Mr. Maple. I did a Mr. Maple unboxing video last week. Uh, should they go ahead and plant the plants or put them in a protected area uh, or unheated garage in zone 7B? Most of those dormant, it, if they're like dormant maples that are zone 5 hardy, you can go ahead and put them in the ground if you wanted to. Uh, if you had some nervousness about it you could definitely put them in an unheated garage uh, overnight anyone who's storing plants in garages when it warms up or you have warm days in between it would be nice to be able to roll those things out so if you could get some of those uh and i bought i ordered some up in baltimore a little cheap uh because we had these big giant plants in the southern living plant collection sunset uh, plant collection space and we just wanted to be able to roll them around so i looked up on amazon just some plant caddies. They're soup. They're pretty inexpensive to get six or eight plant caddies that you can roll these plants back out in the sun if you have larger ones uh, on the sunny days. But any of these plants that you're storing in dark spaces, I would get them out uh, outside when you can. And there's a good amount of days in the winter time that you'd be able to put them outside. Okay, so let's see. This is the last question for uh, this midweek Q&A. Thank you guys so much for participating, asking such great questions. Going to be so a uh, good amount of upcoming content for the Learn to Garden video series. Thank you to everyone who's bought it. There's a $25 gift card down below. If you're interested, you can go over to my website uh, and see um, uh, and uh, take a look at that. But there's a lot of video content on that series, a lot of linked videos uh, from the channel uh, on those videos so that you can learn more about any topic that's over there. There's going to be a lot of content coming during this year. So um, thank you for considering purchasing that if you haven't already. Last question, uh, when will we go visit Jeremy and Megan in their new place uh, down in Mobile? I hope to do it sometime this year. He bought some property, I know, uh, down there already. And we've messaged a little bit, but not a whole lot. But if you followed along with the channel you kind of know this story at this point we actually went down to bell and grath and filmed with todd lasane who is an nc state guy um last that maybe that was two years ago and now jeremy uh is working there at bell and grath with todd so we want to go down and do some content at bell and grath uh, and changes that are happening at bell and grath and of course see um, jeremy and megan's new property as well so looking forward to doing those uh, in the upcoming year, uh, for sure. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, that was another thing about, you know, people in this business, um, you know, I get asked frequently questions about, you know, uh, whether I would, uh, recommend horticulture as a career, you know, and I, I met with a student on campus, uh, not that long ago, uh, asking me cause she was in the decision-making process about, you know, picking horticulture or not. And, you know, I always said, I mean, there are people that do really well in horticulture that own large nurseries and that kind of thing. But a lot of people, you know, aren't getting rich, you know, at this. But it's certainly rewarding 
there's the people that are involved in it are fantastic and you know I, I, I go I get to go to these shows and get to go to places where you just realize that people who garden you know <laughs> are just overall pretty nice people and uh, you know I wouldn't trade you know what I do for anything because you know of the other people that are involved in it so thank you guys very much for following the channel and there'll be another question and answer video on Sunday and a lot of other things we shot in Raleigh that may seem slightly out of order because they were shot slightly before the cold, um, but you'll see those coming up as well. Thanks again.